بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله um, we've reached the final subhanahu jumu'a before Ramadan and may Allah reward you inshallah for if you've been attending and your need is to improve yourself before and prepare yourself for Ramadan, inshallah, you fall out under the category of those who are sabiqul bil khayrat, right? The ones who are rushing forward to do good deeds. Um, so we started, started in the beginning about, you know, comparing Ramadan to a race or to a competition. We said for a competition, there's the participants. We said the three categories of dhalim wali nafsi, the one that's unjust to himself or herself. Muqattasilun, uh, the middle path and sabiqul bil khayrat, right? The ones that we are trying to be, the ones who are rushing forward and doing good deeds. Uh, and then we said there was the preparation. We talked about that. And then last week we talked about the competition itself, which is Ramadan and its goals and, and some of its rules, basically. So we mentioned, يَا يَلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ وَكَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Right? So the siyam itself, we talked about the theme of siyam. We talked about taqwa and the purpose of Ramadan to achieve taqwa. And then we talked about ayyam al ma'adudat, right? How it's a specified time. There's a limited amount of time in Ramadan and take advantage of the time before it's too late. Uh, then we went on to talk about the Quran and that's where we stopped uh, last week. Shahu Ramadan alayhi unzri fi al Quran, huda lil nasi wa bayinat min al huda wal furqan. Faman shahida minkum al shahra fal yasum, wa man kana maridan aw ala safan fa idatum min ayyam al ukhar. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ يُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرَ وَيُتْرِكْمِلُ الْعِدَّةِ وَيُكَبِّرُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So this ayah encompasses many of the other themes that we're not have enough time to get all into it but basically Allah is telling us that Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an the month that the Qur'an was revealed as a guidance for humanity uh, and has clear proofs in it and it's an authority and whoever is present in this month they should fast uh, and whoever is ill or on a journey, they can make up the fast at a later time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants ease for you. He does not want uh, hardship for you. So that you may complete this prescribed period. And that you can proclaim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatness. For guiding you. So that you may attain gratefulness. So that you can be thankful. We mentioned many of the fadail of the Qur'an and how... The Qur'an, for every single letter that we read, is Ashra Hasanat, right? Alif, La, Mim, 30 Hasanat. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, count how many Hasanat. Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Ali Imran, Nisa, all the way through the Qur'an, how many Hasanat you're going to get if you finish the Qur'an. Um, we said the Prophet ﷺ, uh, basically said this Qur'an will lift a people up and with it, it will disgrace another. And the Qur'an is hujjatan laka aw alayk. And the Qur'an is a proof for you or against you on the Day of Judgment. In some other narrations, there was so many, I didn't mention all of them, but just a couple more, inshaAllah. مَنْ شَغَلُ الْقُرْآنُ وَالذِّكْرِ عَنْ مَسْأَلَةِ عَطَيْتُهُ أَفْضُلُ مَا عَطَى السَّائِلِينَ وَفَضْلُ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَنَ السَّائِلِ الْكَلَامِ كَفَضِلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى عَلَى خَلْقِهِ So the... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith Qudsi that whoever is occupied or preoccupied with the Qur'an in my remembrance, um, I will give him more than anything he can ask for, right? So instead of having to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you're occupied with always reading the Qur'an, always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you everything you have wanted to ask for and more. And Allah says that, فَضْلُ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ the, the benefit of the Book of Allah over all the other books is like the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over all of His creation. Meaning there's no comparison. This book has basically encompasses all of the previous revelations, right? All the books that were revealed, the Qur'an encompasses all of the best of all the books that were revealed and more that we need for this life and the next. And it summarizes it for us. The Prophet also, sallallahu alayhi wa he said that whoever does not have anything in his heart of the Qur'an is like the desolate house, the abandoned house, right? a house that you don't want to go to. So it's obligatory upon every Muslim to have at least some Qur'an in their hearts. 
And the one who basically uh, is proficient in the Qur'an or memorizes the Qur'an, he will be with the angels, kiram and barra. And the ones who struggle with the Qur'an, it's difficult for them. They might not know Arabic language as their first language, right? But they still force themselves, they still practice, they still try. They will have double the reward. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that whoever uh, amongst you, he's talking to his companions, would like to go to the such and such valley and get two beautiful golden camels without any ithm, without any sin, meaning for free, basically, without stealing. And the Sahaba said, all of us would love that, Ya Rasulullah, we would all love that. It's like saying, you know, who would like to go to such and such place and get two free Mercedes or two free Porsches or two free, two free like, you know, Ferraris, whatever, something like very expensive, right? He said to go into the, uh, in the masjid or the musalla and learn two ayat of the Qur'an is better than that. And three is better than three. And as many ayat as you learn, imagine memorizing the whole Qur'an, how much reward you will have, Yawm Qiyamah. And I would just like to uh, end with this narration. Some scholars say there's a, a weakness in it, but the meaning is correct. And it has a, it's like a beautiful statement. When the Prophet said to me, said to Ali, radiallahu anhu, innaha satakunu fitnah. There will come a time when there's going to be much tribulation, much like tribulation and, and, and uh, trials and hardships, right? And Ali radiallahu anhu said, وَمَا الْمَخْرَجُ مِنْهَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And what's the escape from that, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet said, كِتَابُ اللَّهِ The Book of Allah. فِيهِ نَبَى مَا قَبْلَكُمْ It has the news or the stories of those that were before you. وَفَصْلُ مَا بَيْنَكُمْ and it's like a criteria between you. وَخَبْرُ مَا بَعْدَكُمْ And it's going to tell you of the things that are to come after you, like in the future, about Jannah, about Nar, about some of the events that will happen. وَهُوَ الْفَصْلُ لَيْسَ بِالْهَزَلِ And it's the criteria, it's nothing that's lightweight or nothing like a joke. مِنْ تَرَكُهُ مِنْ جَبَّارٍ قَصَّمَهُ اللَّهِ Whoever leaves it from those who are arrogant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will break them down. وَمِنْ ابْتِغَى الْهُدَى فِي غَيْرِهِ أَضَلَّهُ اللَّهِ and whoever seeks guidance from other than it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow him to go astray. المتين, and it's the rope of Allah, the sturdy rope of Allah. الحكيم, and the most wise of remembrances. المستقيم, and it's a straight path. الألسن, الأهواء, الرد, العلماء, Basically that it's something that the tongues cannot confuse and people cannot lead it astray or like trick people with it. And the ulama never get enough of it, right? They always want to recite the Qur'an. The true scholars are always like that. And its miracles are never ending. Even until this day when you read the Qur'an, you're discovering new miracles, right? Stuff that they could not have known about at the time of the Prophet It's a continuous miracle. In the Arabic language, the more that you study the Arabic language, the more you see this is not something from humanity. It's something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And this is the book that he gave us to read in the month of Ramadan, it was revealed. So take that book and make it a part of your life. How much Qur'an are you going to read during Ramadan? Right. From now, what do you think you're going to read? Some say, inshallah, they'll do the whole book in one month. Some, inshallah, will finish it every week. Right. Some, you know, from the Salaf, especially, they used to finish it every three days. Some of the Salaf used to finish it every single day. And some, subhanAllah, there are some narrations that they finish it twice a day. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He put barakah in their time. And they use their time to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of you might say that it's far-fetched, but my roommate, uh, when I was studying in Medina, personally, he and his companion, they wanted to compete with one another, not in sports or video games or something like that, but in the Qur'an, subhanAllah. So they prayed Qiyam al after Tarawih in Ramadan with each other, and they finished the Qur'an in that Salat. The whole Qur'an in one night. 
When I was studying in Egypt with Sheikh uh, Usam Abdul Adim, Rahimullah Ta'ala, I mean, I didn't study too much with him, but I used to attend his masjid, especially during Ramadan. I would make etikaf there. Um, he would finish the Quran three times in the last ten nights. So it's not something that's far-fetched. If we put our mind to it, and we, get the, we, we, we put our time, like organize our time, we can read the Quran more than just once, inshallah. Right. One of the du'at, the college to Islam, a younger person, was saying that, you know, I used to find this hard to believe that somebody can finish the Qur'an in, in one day or, 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 or less. And he said, until I saw the people with their uh, cell phones, meaning that like the people on their cell phones with social media and, you know, Facebook and YouTube and uh, what is Instagram and TikTok and X or Twitter or whatever it's called now, subhanAllah, how much time people spend on their phones, texting, calling, all that stuff. If you add that time all up, and you used it for the Qur'an, how much Qur'an can you fin finish, subhanAllah? So this is one of the themes, the competition is the Qur'an. Inshallah, we should try our best to complete the Qur'an and have a relationship with the Qur'an. And it's not just making a khatam, but also try to understand the Qur'an. That's more important, actually. To really understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's many other themes, but like I said, there's not enough time. So the other th theme that I wanted to focus on was a dua calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the following ayah after we read those previous ones. وَإِذَا سَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ وَجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَيْسَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when my servants ask you, O Messenger of Allah, about me, tell them I am near. And I respond to their prayers when they call upon me. So let them respond to me with obedience and believe in me and I will guide them to the right way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's telling us, commanding us to call upon Him. Right? Ad-du'a. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Ad-du'a hu al-ibadah. In one narration, Ad-du'a hu mukh al-ibadah. That the du'a is the essence of worship. In one narration, in another narration, du'a is worship. Right? What a beautiful thing that calling upon your Lord and asking your Lord for what you need and what you want and your desires and your, your, you know, your problems is a form of worship. If you ask humanity, you ask somebody for something, maybe the honorable one or the generous one, he won't have a problem. But if you ask him again and again and again, sometimes they get, okay, stop asking me, that's enough, right? They get annoyed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets angry if you don't ask him. As the poet, he said, لا تسألن بني آدم حاجة واسأل الذي أبوابه لا تحجب الله يغضب إن تركت سؤاله وبني آدم حين يسأل يغضب The poet, he said that don't ask the child of Adam for your needs. Right? But ask the one whose doors are always open. Allah, He gets angry with you if you leave asking Him. And the child of Adam gets angry with you when you ask of Him. SubhanAllah. Look how kareem Allah Azza wa Jal is. He wants us to ask of Him. Another ayah, Allah, He says, وَقَالَ رَبَّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسَّجِيبَ لَكُمْ that Allah he says, call upon me, I will answer you. Verily the ones who have arrogance in calling upon me, because only the arrogant ones won't call upon Allah, the only the arrogant ones don't admit their weakness and, and, and humble themselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, verily they will be thrown into the hellfire. So not calling upon Allah actually is a sin. Calling upon Allah is one of the most noble of actions, as the Prophet said, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَكْرَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى مِنَ الدُّعَى There's nothing more noble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than dua. And the Prophet he said, stressing the point that if you don't ask Allah, he gets angry. مَنْ لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ Whoever doesn't ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, he gets angry with them. And he said that the most incapable of people are the ones who are most incapable in their du'a. Meaning that if you don't make du'a, 
you are considered of the a'jaz, the mu'ajizin, the ones that are like not able to accomplish anything in life. The losers, basically. If you want to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with you, the ma'iyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that only Allah knows how, the Prophet said, Allah says, أَنَا عِنْدَ ظَنِّ عَبْدِي بِي وَأَنَا مَعَهُ إِذَا دَعَانِي That I am as the, my servant thinks of me and I am with him or with her when they call upon me. So when you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is actually with you. So the arkan or pillars of dua, some scholars say, if you look at the dua of the noon or the noon, Yunus alayhi salam. Does anybody know his dua? Yes. Yes, mashallah. La ilaha ila ant subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. So they say, Rukun al-awwal is La ilaha ila Allah. Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a belief in his oneness. And then, tanzih, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanaka. And number three, لِتِرَافْ بِالذَّمْ Admitting to your shortcomings, to your faults, to your loneliness, to your humbleness. إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ So if you combine these three affairs into your dua, inshaAllah, most likely your dua will be accepted. And this beautiful dua is a dua of karb or hardship. Anytime you're in a very hard situation, make the dua of Yunus and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you relief, inshaAllah. Some of the adab of dua or the manners that we should you know, include in our dua Number one is making sure that you're doing it with ikhlas, right? Sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they want to show off that they're making dua, to show off that they're pious or something like that. That is not acceptable, obviously. You want to humble yourself and call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely. Number two, you start with praising Allah and sending the salat ala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? The salutations upon our Prophet Muhammad and praise of Allah. That's the good way to start the dua. So alhamdulillah or bismillah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illa subhanak anni kutum al dhanimin, Allah salli wa sallam sayyidina Muhammad, something like this, right? And then start the dua. Um, be certain in your dua. The Prophet said, Udu Allah wa antu muqinuna bil ijaba. Call upon Allah and you have certainty that He will answer your dua. Have I, I don't know if I said it to you guys before, but Allah, He always answers the dua. Maybe not in the way that you like it to be answered, but he will answer it. Either he will answer exactly as what you're asking for, or he will give you something better, or he will remove a harm from you that was going to befall you. Right? In this dunya, maybe he saves you from a punishment or evil or sickness. Or he keeps it for you on the day of judgment when you need it the most and you will love it the most. So Allah keeps his promise. If he says, as lakum, I will answer you, he will answer us no matter what. Like I said, it might not be the way you're picturing it, or it might not be exactly how you want it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's best for us, better than our own selves. Just have certainty Allah will answer your dua, and make dua with that in your mind, in your heart. Also, calling upon Allah in a humble manner, right? Khudu'a wa khushu'a. Humble yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having a attentive heart and attentive mind. You know, like if you're talking to somebody, just a normal human being, and your mind is wandering and you're lost in your conversation, the other person is going to think like something is wrong with you. Like, you know, especially if you're asking him for something. If you go to the boss to ask for, you know, permission of a vacation or a raise or whatever, or you go to some government official that you need something done, and when you're asking him, you're like, you don't care you're, how you're asking, your mind is not with you, you know, you're focused on something else, you're distracted. They're going to think, what's wrong with this person? Why should I give you anything? Why should I help you with you, right? This is human beings I'm just talking about. But how about when you're going to pray or ask Allah Azza wa Jal, the king of the whole universe, the owner of everything, right? He doesn't need anything from us. So at least have your mind and your heart focused on, on your dua that you're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, if you can, face the qibla, raising your hands, is also one of the uh, adab of dua. Um, being in a state of tahara, if you're able to. These are not the requirements, but they're just something that's preferred. Um, using Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes when you call upon Him, right? Interceding with His names and attributes. And those are some of the adab that we should have. 
some of the things that will prevent your dua from being accepted. Does anybody have any? Uh, haram? Yes, if you're eating haram, right, or taking in haram. Uh, this is one of the things that can prevent your dua from being accepted. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ لَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبٌ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَمْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِمَا أَمْرَ بِهِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ فَقَالَ تَعَالَى يَا يَرْسُلُ كُلُّ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَعْمَنُ الصَّالِحَةِ وَقَالَ تَعَالَى يَا يَرْسُلُ كُلُّ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقَنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ رَجُلْ يُطِيرُ السَّفَرْ أَشْعَةَ أَغْبَرْ يُمَدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامِ فَأَنَّى يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ So the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah is pure and He likes or loves the pure. And Allah commands the believers what He commanded with the Prophets. O you who believe, eat from, uh, O messengers, eat from the tayyibat, the good things, and do good deeds. And He said, O you who believe, eat from the tayyibat, the pure things that we have provided for you. And then He mentions a man who has all these characteristics of, you know, the dua to be accepted, basically, apparently. He's traveling, he's in a very humble state, disheveled. Covered in dust, poor. He raises his hands to this heavens. Ya Rab, he's calling upon Allah's names and attributes. Ya Rab, Ya Rab. But his food is earned from haram. His drink is earned from haram. His clothing is earned from haram. He's nourished with haram. So how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer his du'as? So scholars say that you be very keen to only take in the halal into your body, in your earnings, inshaAllah. Number two. Um, not being attentive in the du'a Like we said One of the ways for your du'a to be accepted Is to have your heart and your mind involved in it One of the ways your du'a is not accepted Is not being attentive in your du'a Or not being certain in your du'a Maybe Allah will answer Maybe Allah won't answer Who knows Or your heart's not into it The Prophet ﷺ said Call upon Allah And you are sure that he will answer you And and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not answer the dua from a heedless heart. If your heart's not into it, Allah will not answer your duas. Number four, that's two and three basically. Uh, so uh, not being certain or having a heedless heart. And number four is making dua for something that is haram or cutting off relations of the family. You can't make dua for something haram and you can't make dua to cut off relations you know, between you and your family. Number five, um, trying to rush the dua or giving up on making dua before it has been answered. Right? There's a hadith that the Prophet said that a servant was calling upon Allah, making dua, making dua. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this to happen? Why does Allah He allows somebody to keep making dua but He doesn't give it to him right away, for example? Or her? Yeah, he could be keeping something better planned for you. What else do you think? It brings you closer to Allah because you're always calling on Allah and you keep going back to Him, you keep making dua to Him. And there's a hadith that says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to hear the voice of His servant calling upon Him. SubhanAllah. So you're earning the love of Allah when you're making dua. And Allah loves to hear your voice if you're making dua. SubhanAllah. So rushing the dua like, oh, Allah is not answering me, khalas, I'm not going to make dua anymore. That's from the tricks of the shaitan. Right? We don't want to fall into that trap. Keep making dua because at the very least, you're getting the love of Allah, you're performing an ibadah, you're getting rewards for doing it, and like I said, Allah will answer you. Either immediately or in the future, or like I said, in a way that you didn't even expect, but in a better that way that you were even asking for. So don't give up on making the duas. Tayyip, what are some of the best times to make dua? What time? When? Tahajjud. Tahajjud? Did you say Tahajjud? Or, can you, tahajjud. Yeah, Tahajjud, right? The last third of the night? Yes, in the last part of the night, that's one of the best times to make dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, comes in a way fitting His Majesty and asks, Is there any of my servants that have a need? I can fulfill their need. Is there any of my servants that want something? I will give it to them. So call upon me. So the be- last third of the night, if you get up before Fajr and pray Qiyam al-Layl, that's one of the best times to make dua. And also, you're not disturbed with the distractions of the dunya. And you're alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell you, what other times? 
Yes, upon breaking the fast. The Prophet ﷺ said that the dua of the one who's breaking his fast is accepted. Right? What else? In sujood, mashallah. You guys have all the answers, alhamdulillah. Yes? Uh, between the adhan and the qama. Very good, mashallah. And when it's raining, alhamdulillah. I think you guys got almost all of them. Uh, and you're traveling, mashallah. That's the other one. And one more I think I have. The last hour of Jum'ah, right? Or after Asr until Maghrib, that time period, the dua is accepted. Also, Sorry. yes? I also heard that the uh, time between two khutbahs when the imam is sitting down. Yes, some scholars say that when the imam ascends to the member, or like some scholars say between the break between the two khutbahs, that's also time to make that dua might be accepted. Yes? Yes, mashallah, when you're in, in a hardship or you're in distress, that's one of the best times to make dua. So very good, mashallah. We said um, before Fajr, like last third of the night, uh, between the Adhan and the Iqama, upon breaking the fast, when it's raining, uh, when you're in sujood, during times of hardship, and when you're traveling, inshallah. Zakallah. You guys got all of them, alhamdulillah. Play. So that's basically, alhamdulillah, the competition or the goals aspect of Ramadan. And then we have the final part of the competition which is the rewards right the the benefits that we reap from fasting or from Ramadan in particular uh, the prophet or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in a hadith Qudsi and this is, should be sufficient for us to want to fast Kullu amal ibn Adam lahu illa siyam fa innahu li wa ana bihi that all the actions of the child of Adam are for them except fasting it is for me. Allah is attributing it to Himself. And I will reward accordingly. Right? Accordingly, Allahu A'lam how much? Because we know the regular amal that's for us is like 10 to 70 to 700 to 1,000, a million, whatever. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He didn't put a limit on it. He said, An I will take care of it. I will take care of His reward. Why? Because the scholars say that siyam is one of the most sincere deeds you can do because nobody really knows if you're fasting except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it has complete ikhlas in it, right? And if you do the other benefits of fasting, like we said, keeping away from that which is prohibited, obviously, and have a higher level of fasting, your reward gets even greater and greater. But also, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-sawmu junna yusjanna biha al-abdu min al-nar. Yusjanna biha al-abdu min al-nar. That the sawm is a shield or protection and it will protect the companion of the fasting from the hellfire the siyam will shield you from the hellfire right it'll protect you from going to hell and this is when i say siyam obviously it means fasting sincerely for the sake of allah fulfilling its obligations and staying away from that which is prohibited some people like they fast literally abstain from food and drink and you know intimacy with the wife or the the wife with the husband, etc. But they indulge in namima or kadi backbiting or or lying or cheating or stealing, or they look at the haram, right? What kind of fast is that? The Prophet ﷺ said, That if a person doesn't leave foul speech or foul actions, Allah does not need you to leave your food and your drink. That perhaps a person is fasting, he has nothing from his fast except hunger and thirst. So the point like we studied, we said last week, is the tame taqwa. If you are abstaining from the halal, but you're not abstaining from the haram, there's something wrong with your siyam. So the real siyam obviously is fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your obligations, your faraid, and staying away from that what's prohibited. If you want to get to the higher level of a siyam, you go the next step, which is not even wasting your time on, on, on unnecessary things. And you focus solely on the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this month. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we don't know if we'll get it again. How many people have passed away already in the last, between the last Ramadan and now? Right? Last Ramadan, how many times did we tell ourselves, oh, I wish I did this more, I wish I did this more, oh, I wish I could have you know, prayed more qiyam or read more Qur'an. Khalas, now you have the opportunity. Allah is giving us another chance. If we make it, inshallah, may Allah allow us to make the month of Ramadan. 
So take this golden ticket, inshallah. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, uh, he was asked uh, by one of the companions, what is something that will basically get me into Jannah? Ya Rasulullah, murni bi amrin yanfa'uni illah bihi qala alayka bisawm fa'innahu la mithla lah. He said, what is something that will like help me or benefit me or get me into Jannah? He said, I advise you with fasting for there's no comparison. There's nothing to compare to it. And then he says, talking about the beauty of fasting, Really, there's a door in Jannah called Ar-Rayyan. Only the fasting people will enter through it on the day of judgment. Nobody else will enter except the fasting one. They'll say, where is the fasting ones? The door will ask the people, where are the fasting people? And the fasting people will go through the doors, and after all the fasting people will enter to it, it will close and nobody else will be able to get through. There are some people, alhamdulillah, they will be able to enter through all eight doors for all the great deeds that they have done in this dunya. We ask Allah to make us of those, inshaAllah. The siyam is also a shafi' for you, yawm al-qiyamah. So if you have too many sins or you, your scales are not so heavy with good deeds, the siyam and the Qur'an will actually come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make shifa' for you. The Prophet sallallahu he said, As-siyam wal-Qur'an yashfi'ani lil-abdi yawm al-qiyamah. Yaqulu as-siyam, Ay Rabb, mana'atu al-ta'am wa shahwahat bil-nahar fashafa'ni fi. That... The Prophet said, fasting and the Qur'an will intercede for the companion, its companion on the Day of Judgment. So the fast will actually come. We don't know how exactly, but the fast will come on the Day of Judgment. And he said, oh my Lord, he prevented himself from his lower desires and from food for your sake. So I intercede on his behalf. Please accept my intercession on his behalf or her behalf. And the fasting will save you from the hellfire. ويقال القرآن ويقول القرآن منعته النوم بالليل فشفع عني فيه قال فيشفع عنا and the Quran will come and say that I you know was preventing him or he prevented sleep because of reciting me the Quran so intercede for him on my behalf and Allah سبحانه وتعالى will answer or give them the shifa and save them from the hellfire for the siyam and the Quran the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the fasting person will have Two happiness, two times to enjoy and, and feel with delight. When he breaks his fast, you know how you feel after a long day of fasting. You're tired and you, you're hungry and you're thirsty and then you eat that date and how sweet does it taste. And you drink that cool water, how delicious it tastes. And you're so happy, subhanAllah. And you thank Allah for allowing you to fast and complete your fast and you enjoy that nutrition, right? And then even greater fast uh, happiness will be when you meet your Lord, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the scent of the mouth of the fasting person is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the greatest, you know, uh, misk or, or perfumes in this world. These are the beauties of Siyam. Specifically with Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ said, من صام رمضان إيمان واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبي Whoever fasts Ramadan with Iman, right? And he Things that Allah subhanahu wa is going to answer, accept his fasting and his prayers and his du'as, he all his sins, previous sins will be forgiven. That this is a month that the doors of Jannah are open and the doors of the hellfire are closed and the shayateen are chained down. Right? Some scholars say this is literal. That the actual doors of Jannah are open up for the believers and, and the doors of hellfire are closed for the believers. And the shayateen, the major uh, jinn and shayateen are chained. Right? And some say it's metaphorical in the sense that the acts of righteousness are opened up so much in Ramadan. You're fasting, you're praying, you're reciting Quran, some doing tarweeh, some doing etikaf, right? So the abwab of Jannah is open, the abwab of, of uh, amal al-salih is open for you, right? And you're too busy and preoccupied with righteousness to be busy with sin. So the doors of the hellfire are closed for you. Both, inshallah, are correct. Wallahu a'lam. This is a shahr al-mubarak, the Prophet ﷺ said. And um, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has uh, basically every single night, Lillahi wa taqa min fi kulli yawm wa layla fi Ramadan, inna rabbakum, wa inna li kulli muslim fi kulli yawm wa layla, da'wa al mustajab lah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wa taqa min al nar every single night and day in Ramadan. Those people that are freed from the hellfire. You might have been destined to go to the hellfire, but Allah, because of your fasting and your praying and your good deeds, Allah saves you from the hellfire. And also, there is every single layla of Ramadan, a dua that you make that's accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a month that, there's no other month like it, to take advantage of it. This month is a month that you get your sins forgiven. The Prophet said, as salatul khams وَالْجُمْعَةُ إِلَى الْجُمْعَةُ وَرَمَضَانِ رَمَضَانِ مُكَفِّرَاتٍ مَا بَيْنَهُمْ إِذَا إِذَا اجْتَنَبَتْ كَبَائِرٍ That from the five daily prayers, and that's a daily basis, in Jum'ah to Jum'ah, a weekly basis, and Ramadan to Ramadan, a yearly basis, if you do these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives your sins or wipes away your sins. Except the kabair, the major sins, requires tawbah. But all your sins are being cleaned when you're fasting, inshaAllah. The month of Ramadan. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I won't recite, well, basically, he was saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And then the Sahaba asked him, why are you saying, you know, Ameen, 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 three times? And he said, Jibreel came to him and he said, uh, whoever reaches his parents in old age, or one of them in old age, and his sins are not forgiven, may Allah not forgive him. And the Prophet said, Ameen. And then he said, whoever reaches Ramadan and he's not forgiven, may Allah not forgive him. And he said, Ameen. And he said, whoever I mentioned to him, meaning the Prophet وسلم, and they don't say, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may he not be forgiven or maybe he pushed away. فَبْعَدُهُ right? So this month is very important for us to have a time to get our sins forgiven. Right? Making your niyyah from now that you're going to fast, inshallah, and reap the rewards of this month. Some of the other benefits, like we said, are the Quran, because the Quran was revealed in Ramadan, and all, in some narrations, all the previous books were revealed in Ramadan. So it is a month of revelation, which is teaching us to focus on the revelation, to focus on the Quran. If you make uh, Umrah during Ramadan, it's like making the Hajj. In some narrations, Hajj with the Prophet, right? Um, one of the other benefits of Ramadan that's not in other months is that there's a tikaf. You know, if you find a masjid, if you're able to do so, the last 10 nights, the Prophet Sallallahu he would stay in the masjid and devote himself to worship. This is like something that we can do as Muslims um, to kind of experience, you know, the zuhd, basically, getting away from the dunya and focusing on, on the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The last time of the Prophet Sallallahu his last year, he did two, two weeks, uh, 30, uh, what do you call it, 20 days of Ramadan in the last, you know, for the last 20 days, he stayed in the masjid, subhanAllah, reviewing the Qur'an and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so these are some of the blessings. The other one, the major one, is إِنَّ أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْتِ الْقَدْرِ Right, Laylat al-Qadr is in Ramadan, the night of power, the night of decree. وَمَا دَرَاكَ مَا لَيْتِ الْقَدْرِ What is the, what can give you like the best or inkling of Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power? خَيْرُ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ It is better than a thousand months. How much is a thousand months? How many? 82 years? 83 years, 82 years? Over 80 years, right? But Allah says, خَيْرُ مِنْ More or better than 80 years. So this is, some scholars say that it's according to your a'mal during this month. Some people have a'mal of better than 80 years, some people have a'mal better than 100 years, some people a thousand years, some people a million years. So imagine if you have ikhlas and you make the night of Ramadan and you have that worship equal to a million years, subhanAllah, of ibadah, of reciting the Quran, of qiyam al-layl, of fasting, right? All these good deeds, all the dua, everything. So the last 10 nights are very special for the Muslim to try to seek out the night of power, right? We want Ramadan the whole month to improve ourselves. We don't want to start Ramadan and leave Ramadan as the same person. We want to be a better person. And especially, like we're talking about the competition, the last 10 nights are the most competitive part of the competition. We want to strive and push ourselves the most during that last 10 nights, right? So if you can, inshallah, 
planning from now, like we said about the preparation part, you know, leave those last 10 nights that you can focus on Taraweeh or Qiyam al layl or Dua or reading Quran, right? And especially the odd nights, because most likely um, Layl al Qadr is in the odd nights of the last 10 nights, right? So these are some of the preparation, inshallah, and descriptions of the Quran about the specialness of Ramadan, right? And what we should be focusing on achieving, achieving taqwa, taking advantage of our time, reciting the Quran, right? Um, calling upon Allah, making dua. These are the things that we want to make special this month. Right? We don't want to make it like any other month because it's not. And we want to be especially better in Ramadan than we normally are. And then when Ramadan is over, we don't want to just be like Ramadan Muslims. Right? Khalas, I've done my duty. Hatta yati'ikul yaqeen. You keep striving and moving forward and getting better and better until death comes to us. So inshallah, that's the, mostly the spiritual aspect and preparations. Um, inshallah, tomorrow we'll do the fiqh aspect, the fiqh of Ramadan. Right? The, what the fasting entails, what breaks the fast, what doesn't break the fast. Um, you know, certain uh, people that have excuses for sicknesses or traveling or women who are breastfeeding or women who are, you know, pregnant. Uh, these type of things, inshallah, we'll try to cover tomorrow. And that will be it. Then subhanAllah, Ramadan will start maybe Sunday evening. Allahu alam. So we're here. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to make it to Ramadan and to fast Ramadan and to stand in the prayers in Ramadan and to do uh, righteousness and increase our rewards. And do not forget our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering in Palestine and elsewhere uh, in your du'as, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Subhanakallah. Bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa Allah. If you have any questions, inshallah, tafadru. If not, we will end. Yes. Sir, you so precondition of the du'a is so why do we make uh, dua in sujood? So uh, at that time you can say salat It's not it's not a precondition, it's just recommended. So this is more of the one the dua that you're not in the salat, but you're raising your hands, for example, and making a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sujood, you've already you know you're gonna make salat wa salam on your tashahud. So you don't need to do it in sujood. After you do the tasbih, you can go straight to dua and make any dua you want with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another point I forgot to mention that you reminded me of Zakhla Khir, when you're in sujood, is one of the times that you're closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you bow your head down to prostration, that's when you're closest to Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's one of the best times to make dua to Him. You know, especially in the last third of the night, you make wudu, you get up before Fajr, nobody knows what you're doing, nobody sees you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get down in prostration and you call upon Allah and ask Him for you know, forgiveness and your needs and you know, blessings and protection and all these things for our families and ourselves, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khair.